coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. You probably got to see his his pet trout that were in the pond behind the house. There were a few occasions where he insisted on giving me a roll casting lesson. And he said, you know, I want you to aim for that that branch across the way. And I said, Frank, I can't, I can't cast it 70 feet with a roll cast. And he say, you know, you do it like this, you do it like this. And I, and while I, while I never quite was able to make the distance, I was with a little help from him. I was able to get a lot closer than I ever thought I, I could roll cast. That was Chris Santella taking us into the great Frank Moore's trout pond, fly fishing legends, the 50 great places and Chris's steelhead music today on the swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the show. Today's episode is sponsored by Zag.Fish, who creates ethically sourced premium fly tying materials with their 5D brushes. These are the Fair Flies brushes that we've talked about before. Zag.Fish is the place you can go to pick up Fair Flies products and the other stuff they have going on in the fly tying uh, niche. 5D brushes contain the perfect portions that I great streamer, bass flies, saltwater flies, and we're going to be using some of these flies even more as we do some of these saltwater trips. You can check out uh, zag.fish right now by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash zag. That's Z-A-G. Today's episode is sponsored by Drifthook, who has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy-to-follow guides. You can head over to Drifthook right now and get 15% off your next order by using swing at the checkout. That's Drifthook, D-R-I-F-T-H-O-O-K dot com. Chris Santilla takes us into the 50 Places to Visit Before You Die series. We find out what the 50 great fly fishing destinations are, along with some of the other 50 great topics he has going. We find out how he slowly made his way out west, what it was like interviewing some of the greats in fly fishing and outdoor sports, and how he conducts an interview, and how he created an album around steelhead fishing with his band. So without further ado, here we go. Chris Santella from Steelhead Communications. How's it going, Chris? Oh, it's going great, Dave. Uh, nice to connect with you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for making a little time uh, today to dig into um, a little bit of your background. You've got something I, I didn't really realize this until I kind of got into. I mean, I knew I've heard about these you know books for a while, but the Fifty Places books, right? You've got this thing going, these series of not only fly fishing but other you know outdoor uh, kind of adventures and, and kind of topics. So we're gonna dig into a little bit of that, a little bit of probably some steelhead because you've got a big focus on steelhead and. And just kind of your your life of what you do here, but bring us back really quickly before we get there. Just fly fishing. I like to hear the story of how you got started fly fishing. Sure. Um, well, I grew up in Connecticut, not necessarily known as a cradle of fly fishing, and uh, I knew no one that fly fished. But I I believe it was in a dentist's office when I was about thirteen or fourteen. I saw a spread that showed someone. And I guess we would now call shadow casting. So I saw the the beauty of the setting and the grace of that fly line billowing out behind the angler. And, and I just thought, wow, that looks pretty cool. And I must have mentioned it to my to my folks. And it turned out that uh, an uncle of mine belonged to a little boat club in uh, in Norwalk, where I lived, which is on the Long Island Sound, and one of his fellows at the at the boat club built rods on the side just for his own pleasure. So that Christmas, I got a Fenwick rod that this fellow had wrapped, fiberglass, and a little Fluger reel. And so I was I was ready to go. Um, and that uh, that following spring, which I think would have been in 1978, uh, my mom was kind enough to get up early each Saturday and drag me to one of the streams around Fairfield County, Connecticut, that was stocked with trout for the first month or two of the season. By June, the water was too warm, and I'm sure most of the fish died, but it was cold enough those first few months to sustain a few fish. And and I just kind of tried to figure it out. Um and I 
after probably seven or eight trips with nothing, I, I still remember the very first trout I caught. It was uh, in Westport, Connecticut, it, right near a corporate park. Uh, there was a section of river that Trout Unlimited stocked, and fish came to a Royal Coachman streamer, nice. which is a fly that I have not seen since. <laughs> but, yep. uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure it was it was skittering madly across the surface, not exactly the the right presentation, but uh, a little hatchery brown trout took it, and I and I har- harvested it, and my mom was kind enough to cook it up for dinner for she and my dad, and and uh, that was that. I was wow. I was hooked, as they say. Yep. And uh, you know, for for a long time, most of my fly fishing was uh, was a a little more warm water oriented. Uh, my grandparents had a cottage up in coastal Maine. They were from Maine. And I was, I really got my casting chops out in a canoe fishing for large and smallmouth bass with poppers. Uh, and I realized that maybe there were aspects of fly fishing that weren't as effective as, as spin fishing or bait casting casting but fishing with poppers was a lot more effective than my buddies with the jitterbugs because if i got a a a hit and missed a fish i could cast it right back where they had to reel it all the way in and cast again so i realized that uh, that fly fishing was not only more graceful but it could also be more effective than conventional tackle oh nice nice so you got some still water some some of that going on and so yeah, I w- I wanted to. So you're in Connecticut, you know, and I'm curious when that transition. You know, the western. You know, how did you? When did you m- make it across? Was that a gradual or was that a jump out west? It was. Uh, it was kind of gradual. Uh, you know, I went to college up in Vermont at Middlebury College, and then I came back down to Connecticut and uh, worked around the advertising field for a couple of years, and then I went to graduate school. Though my parents are past now, I, I to do their ghosts justice, I went to graduate school at Yale, which they were very proud of. Uh, oh wow! It really didn't mean as much to me, but but it was a big thing at the time. I think for a second generation yeah. family in Connecticut to have their son go to Yale, and, and sure. they thought that that uh, I would be all taken care of from there. But as I was in the the business program, which I thought was more of a public policy program uh at the time i was fairly miserable but i managed to uh, hang in there because there was a little loophole at the time where you could as long as you were taking graduate level classes you could uh take classes all around the university so i think i took the minimum amount of business courses and then took divinity courses and literature courses and uh yeah. so i really got a graduate degree in liberal arts uh and uh <laughs> after I spent I spent about a year in uh, northwestern Connecticut trying to live what I perceived to be the writer's life and was absolutely miserable because there were no young people up there and uh, I was very isolated. And uh, I remember that I, I because of the, uh, the graduate school, I, I got an invitation to get an American Express card. My certainly my. Um, my finances at the time did not qualify me for one, but I, I got it because there was a free plane ticket anywhere. And I went to San Francisco where I had some friends and uh, just fell in love with that city. So I moved out there in, uh, I guess it was uh, summer of 90. And, uh, you know, I, I started fishing more and more because you, though there's nothing right close to San Francisco, you know, three hours to the east is the Truckee River and the Little Truckee and a lot of other streams. And uh, three hours north, you know, you're getting up into the, the Upper Sac, Lower Sac, Trinity River. Uh, so that was where I really started fishing more and more and, and saw the the potential for larger fish and wild and native fish and, you know, got me much more, more jazzed about fly fishing than I had been when I was living in, living in New Haven. And, uh, in 99, in part, because I, I knew there would be easier access to, to more fishing and, and 
San Francisco had changed with the with the dot com era. It wasn't quite the the place that uh, oh, right. it was when I first arrived. So we were looking. My wife and I were looking for for places to go, and and we had been to Portland in all seasons. We wanted to make sure we could deal with a little cooler weather and the and the rain, but. I had grown up in New England. She had grown up in Michigan. So colder weather was not a problem. So right. we made the move up to Portland in, in 99 and have been here ever since. And, uh, I, I had been, uh, I had been steelhead curious, certainly, uh, in my years in California, of course, uh, the Russian river, which is now very, yep. very much depleted in terms of steelhead. But at one time it, you know, we used to have runs of 50 or 60,000 fish. So there was a lot of lore around steelhead around the Bay Area. And uh, so I, I was quite enamored with the idea of steelhead. And, and the only experience I'd really had had been on a one guided trip on the Russian quote unquote fly fishing, though what the, the guide was actually doing, he had some flies that basically had a had a a lip built into them and he was back bouncing the flies. So you're holding a fly rod, but other than that, <laughs> there was no fly fishing involved. But I had two fish take that day, you know, nearly pulling the rod out of my hand. And uh so I, I though I hadn't had quite the swing the fly experience yet, I had had a little taste of it. And yep. uh it took me uh it took me a few months to find my first steelhead on a fly, but uh, I, I, it happened on the North Umpqua River uh, oh, wow. on a on a skated fly of all things, just kind of dumb luck, Jeez. like so often happens. And, and so it was a great way to start. Then it took me a, a long time after that to, to find another fish, <laughs> as you might imagine. <laughs> given, given that good fortune, uh, wow. the steelhead gods got back at me, but... Uh, but th that was sort of the the beginning. And uh, uh, what fly was that? You what was the fly? Do you remember the fly? Yeah, uh, you know, it was it was a little bit like a muddler, but it had a it had wings coming off. Uh, it was it was something I picked up in in the steamboat fly shop. Uh, I and I can't remember the exact name. And I held on to it for a while, but then. You know, I, I was short a fly, and, and there it was, and I tied it on and put it in a tree across on the uh, the home pool there at, at near Steamboat, and that was that. <laughs> so was that in uh, this was like two thousand? Yeah, it, exactly. It was it was uh, the year later. It might have even been in ninety in ninety nine. <laughs> that uh, yeah, shortly after I I had been lucky enough to get the fish, and I I partnered with the fly, but. Um, have the memory gotcha and was frank moore was that was he in that time was that were they at the steamboat there run that thing uh frank frank and Jeannie were did not they did not uh own or operate uh steamboat anymore at that time it was uh owned by jim and sharon van loan at, at that point but um I you know I got to know Frank a few years later and and like he was to everyone he he was a he felt like a good friend and he made you feel like you were the most yeah. important person in the world anytime you were uh, you were around him so uh, I felt very fortunate yeah, to did. to be able to go up there and visit him quite a few times on uh, Moore Hill Lane. Oh wow yeah yeah that's right nice well yeah and that's a decent time ninety nine you come into the North Pacific Northwest right and the the runs, the steelhead runs are slowly building their way back up from the early 90s, right? So you're getting into 2000s and probably some better and better steelhead fishing. Is that what you saw that, that you know, that 15, 20 years there? You know, it's 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 interesting. Nowadays, uh, you know, I'm very plugged into what is going on with the runs and, and the different management policies that have been put into place for for better or for worse at that time i don't even really remember paying much attention to the dam counts or knowing that it was a good year or a bad year i just i just went out there and did it and i and i would say that in those first few years i have a a good friend uh still a good friend who i fish with a lot uh, named pete gurko who had a drift boat and we would go over and we would we would do um beaver tail to max canyon 
on the Deschutes. We would we would go every week, and it was when I was I guess at that time I was just about forty and I seemed to have a lot more energy than I have now because it would mean we'd get up at three to get our the boat to the put in there by you know five thirty, which was just about first light, you know, in late September, early October, and it seemed like we would be coming off the river around eight or nine and home by twelve thirty. And and these days I can't do it anymore. I just crumble to with a long day like that. We we would do the do the float and then and then come back. But um uh, you know, I really, I, I felt like we started getting into, I started dialing in a little bit more when I realized that, you know, you could go out to the mouth and, um, you know, park it. I can't, don't even pay attention. I think it might be Heritage Park there at the mouth of the Deschutes on the east side and then hike up to Blackberry or Rattlesnake, those runs and really do well uh without having the the rigmarole of, of having to take the boat over and arranging a shuttle and and making it a 24-hour experience you could have some very good fishing either in the morning or the afternoon and uh and uh potentially have a, a world-class angling experience i i still feel that some of those runs uh within a mile and a half of the columbia are, are as good as anything you're going to find further up on the deschutes and just the number of fish that that we found there over the years again and again they they seem to produce so uh and as we real as double mountain brewery opened in hood river i realized that the a very perfect day for for me anyway perhaps again being from connecticut a great pizza center would be to head out to uh the disputes at like two or three in the afternoon leaving from northeast portland where i am i could make it to the mouth in about an hour and 20 minutes we would uh fish from you know four four thirty until dark and then race to hood river before the pizza ovens close down and have a hop lava and share a pizza and be home by 11 o'clock and not have not <laughs> having been away from the family for too long but having a chance to get get a grab or two maybe a fish or two to hand and and then uh good good pizza and good beer and uh and back home and sleep in my own bed so it was it's, it's cool. still, so you would still do the same thing it was still a full like day you know yeah, but it was a full day. What you know, maybe a little less fishing, but uh, certainly quality fishing. And what we learned is that even when the salmon are in, you know, you have a fair number of folks that are using conventional tackle out there. They're really focused more on the chinook than they are in the steelhead. But um, you know, they're walking out at four thirty as as we're walking in, and you know, they're I guess when you're fishing conventional tackle, I never really have for steelhead. It does the whether there's light on the water or not doesn't matter quite as much. But you know, they're freeing up all the best water, leaving it what we consider to be the best time. So it work out wonderfully for us to be out there in the late afternoon, as opposed to you know the getting up at three o'clock and to be out there at first light if we're trying to fish the morning session. And uh, some people might look askance at us if we're walking in into Double Mountain at 10.30 in the morning. Right. Where at uh, 9 o'clock at night, it's not as uh, socially unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Did you guys ever think about just staying over like a night camping on the river? Like when you're doing that, like you do oh, the float with the boat oh, back we, we would we would do that a lot we would actually go out and just throw a cot out in the camping area and fish the evening session um you know bring a bring a, a few beverages and a burrito or a sandwich out there and then and then fish the morning section and come home but honestly what we found and this is you know going back just in the last 10 years we really found that a in the morning there was so much competition from from a lot of the conventional anglers and it seemed like there are also more fly anglers too so it meant getting up earlier and earlier to try to get your one run and um and even then you somebody might there be there ahead of you and uh i have found that 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 aspect of steelhead fishing has 
less appeal for me. I, 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 you know, yeah, I'd like to catch a fish and it's, it's fun to be able to fish blackberry proper or this run or that run. But it's, I try to look at the day as more of a, I hate to use this word because it's so overused, but more of a holistic experience. Like I, I like, I, I do better getting a little more sleep. I like to have a nice meal. If I can sleep in my bed as opposed to a cot, I probably prefer that. And gotcha. for all those reasons, yeah. plus, plus the productivity of the fishing, I have, I have found that the evenings have been better out there for me than the mornings. Now, of course, if you start to fish only in the evenings, then your your data pool that you're drawing <laughs> observations from becomes somewhat limited. If if you only if you only fish in the evenings, the evenings are going to fish the best. Yep. But I did find yeah, when I was right. doing both that the evenings tended to be a, l- a little more productive, and again, it just lent itself to a nicer overall day or afternoon. Today's episode is sponsored by Range Meal Bars, made by a small team of passionate outdoor enthusiasts. The Range team only uses the highest quality gluten-free ingredients, and they know they want to fuel your body with the right stuff. We did a recent episode where we talked about backpacking and packing your pack and getting ready for a, might be a hike into a high mountain lake, and we talked about the power of food and getting the right food in your pack and how important that is to shaving off a weight and this bar packs a punch with 700 calories. This is a super dense bar, tastes good, and uh, and it's exactly what uh, we were talking about in that episode. It's, so you can pretty much throw one bar in there if you had to. To be honest, this thing would probably make you through a couple of meals. I eat these things whenever I need to, and usually one chunk of this, one bite, will keep me going for quite a while. So it's quite a bit different now that I've been snacking on these for a while, Definitely than pretty much all the other meal bars because of the caloric intake. And this is important when you're out there for safety or on the water or just staying uh, from, from that, keeping that uh, stomach from growling. Like I said, range bar is small enough to fit in your hand and slides easily to, into your pocket of your vest or sling pack, anything you need. They currently have two flavors. Uh, one is chocolate coffee and the other is molasses, ginger, sea salt. You can check out range right now at wetflyswing.com slash range. R-A-N-G-E, Range Meal Bars. You won't go back to the normal bar. Okay, back to the show. Cool. Well, this is, we could obviously talk steelhead and just shoots all day long, and we have had some episodes on it, and and maybe we'll hold that a little bit till later. I did want to touch base as we're going here on what I think was put you on the map, maybe. I mean, I think I, that's how I first heard about you is these 50 places a uh, series talk about that so you had this background it sounds like in your school harvard or at yale how did you get into this idea of the 50 places to fish in this series well I, you know I, i'll you can you can stop me dave if i go on too much at length but i know no, that there are a lot of folks out there that have maybe thought a little bit about writing at one point or another so i will kind of give you the the longer story here um when we moved up to Oregon, you know, I was working as a marketing manager for a software company, and I was fortunate enough to be able to keep my job in San Francisco for a year and work from from Portland. So I was able to make a little better salary than the going rate was in Portland at the time. And my dream was to segue more to being a freelancer, doing you know advertising and marketing work, but hopefully also doing some writing work, uh, more edit, what we'd call editorial writing, meaning writing for publication as opposed to uh, writing ad copy. And I was starting to make that transition, I'd say, or 2000, 2001, and I was starting to, to place stories in some of the fl- fishing magazines, you know, I mean, I uh, was I in salmon trout steelhead or northwest fly fishing fly rod and reel I got a few pieces in more national publications the New York Times and then travel and leisure but uh, you know I realized that for the amount of time I was spending on writing fly fishing stories and the amount of money I was making and we had one one child at that point in the mortgage i had to look at it and say this just isn't working i mean i can i really i need to focus on either doing the the marketing work or i need to figure out a way to make more money from from writing about outdoor activities such as fly fishing and um i knew just enough about the the publishing world to realize that 
though there were you know a handful of publishers and still are that are focused on the fly fishing market say the the amatos and the stack poles of of the world and and that they do a fine job what they're doing, but their distribution really was in fly shops. And a lot of their books were either the, you know, guidebooks to this state or this river or, or fly tying manuals, that kind of thing. They weren't going to reach a really broad audience. And I would be looking at the same sort of, uh, effort to money balance that I was seeing with the magazines if I went that route. So I realized I needed to do something that would have a little bit more of a mass appeal and um you know i figured that all the the whole notion of bucket list was still not really that prevalent in the in the culture you know there would be the oh, there right. were certainly list oriented articles you'd see but it still wasn't a, a big thing yet and i i don't remember exactly how i came up with the the title but it was a catchy title and I had a rough idea of, of how to write a book proposal just from having studied it down at the Hollywood Library. And uh, I pitched a handful of agents on the idea because I knew, again, to get to a bigger publisher, you needed to be represented. And I was able to entice an agent to take me on. And she helped me with the book proposal. Stephanie Roston is her name, and Levine Greenberg Roston is uh, the agency in New York. And we eventually were able to to bring the the idea to market. And it was right around the time that the the war in Iraq began, so it was not a great time to be trying to promote a kind of a leisure book, but. You know, we we achieved victory in less than a month, as you might recall, on the aircraft carrier. Uh, so things, that's right. The market sort of opened up again, and and she was was that two thousand three, two thousand two, two thousand three. That was two thousand and three. Yeah, I heard that maybe the war lingered a little bit longer, but anyway, uh, that's right. The that's right. the market was the market was receptive to um, leisure books again, and uh, she was. We had. We had offers from Chronicle Books and we had offers from Abrams and the Stephanie said, you know, I think I think Abrams would be a, a better way to go because they do a great job with gift books. And I have to say, like when she said gift books, I was thinking it, it though it was exciting the thought that I would, you know, get a little chunk of money and, and uh be able to publish a book. Gift books sounded more like a prop you'd see in a in a house that's being decorated to go on the market rather than something it would read it wasn't literature as my uh, professors might have said back at middlebury but i realized (laughs) not too far down the road that the great benefit of of a, a gift book is that you know if you're if you look at the demographics for fly fishing say at the time in 2003 2004 maybe there were four or five million fly fishers in the united states and certainly a handful more in england and australia new zealand english-speaking countries where where abram sells its english books but there were a heck of a lot more people who knew someone that fly fished and I have talked to so many people over the years who have received 50 places to fly fish before you die four or five times. Maybe they get it from a, from a nephew who doesn't know that much about their uncle, but knows he, he likes to fish and sees the book in Barnes and Noble. Right. And it seems like a perfect gift. And they are excited because they found something that their uncle would like. The uncle is touched because the nephew thought enough about his passion to find a title that was of interest to him. And hopefully they, he enjoys or she enjoys the book once, uh, once they, they read it. Um, I would say that one of the, one of the pivotal moments in, in the, that whole publishing process was initially the idea was that there would be a line illustration for each of the places that I wrote about of a fly that might be associated with that place. But Abrams said, well, maybe this should be more of a photographic book. Maybe we should, because these are such beautiful places. And I think that that was pivotal in, in making these books have some staying power and being successful in in that gift category because they right. for 24.95 which is the retail price it's a pretty nice 
production value. I mean, you have 40 or 50 uh, illustrations. It's very nice quality paper. There's a nice design element to the book. So uh, it's a pretty nice package for twenty four ninety five. I mean, I feel like, uh, or that was the thinking at the time anyway. And I feel like sometimes the words are just an excuse to string together the, the pretty photographs that, that are selected for the right. books. But, uh, gotcha. but when, when the, when, when the royalty check comes in, I, I, I don't complain. Um, but he, so I did, you know, I did the fly fishing. We're, we're, we're almost, we're almost done here, Dan. But, uh, oh, yeah, this is great. I did the fly keep, fishing keep book. I, you know, I had the mark. I had the mark. I had the the background in marketing and public relations. So I knew that, you know, Abrams at the time was releasing eighty or a hundred books in the spring, and then the same amount in the fall. And they have three PR people and two marketing people. So if I don't put my shoulder to this a little bit nothing's going to happen. You, you get a few hours of someone's time and, and then there's the potential that even if it's a, a good book, it'll just kind of die on the vine. So I, you know, went and found all the names of the two outdoor and sports editors, of the 200 largest newspapers uh, down at the library again. And all of the, not just the sporting magazines, but sort of, the uh, general interest magazines found editors that, that handled like the gift columns. All the po- I tried to look at all the potential markets where a blurb for the book might fit in and complement their editorial, and reached out to all these places and with a synopsis. And I can get you artwork, and I can get you, and I'd be happy to be interviewed. Whatever works, and I had an understanding a little bit of what the media might want. Again, having been on on the publicist end of things for a while. And I managed to get a fair number of placements, both in the sporting press and in more general interest press. And that helped push sales along. And again, it was like one of these first, uh, first of these bucket list sort of books. I think the same year, a thousand and one places to see before you die. uh, Patricia Schultz's book came out. And oddly enough, the same the same attorney at a large white shoe law firm in uh, New York helped to get the the copy the trademark for fifty places has worked with her to get the trademark on a thousand and one places. So oh, wow. there there is a there's a very same. thin dotted line connection there. But you know, so the, the any the short story long the 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 first book did far better than the publisher expected so they they came and asked me if i knew anything about golf and as it turned out i had written about golf as well and still love the game i'm terrible at it but still love it so i applied the the 50 the 50 places formula to golf and the idea again was that i interview people who are um acquainted well well acquainted with the with the sport and well respected in the activity considered experts and ask them not to talk about the best place to fly fish or the best place to golf but one of their favorite experiences uh an experience that that captures the spirit of the activity and the role of place therein strongly for that individual so i think that that's tended to attract you know fairly eclectic um venues uh not all i mean you know when you're when you're say you're doing the fly fishing book uh uh your your niece may not know a ton about fly fishing but she knows that people go fly fishing in Montana. Maybe she's seen a river run through it. So on the back of the book, you got to make sure that, you know, Montana is in there and maybe they know that fishing was born in England. So it'd be a pretty good idea to have an, an English or Scottish destination in there. It's like a reality check for people. Does this person know what they're talking about? Oh yeah. I've heard right. of Pebble Beach or I've heard of, I've heard of, uh, you know, the Yellowstone and, um, but then once you check off a few obvious boxes, then there was the room to, to talk to people and include some more obscure spots. So anyway, you know, the golf book came out, the golf book was, did incredibly well. Matter of fact, they sold out 
30,000 copies or something before Christmas and it came out in the fall and and oh, wow. uh, it was the one time I, th- I think it was in the top 30 Amazon books not top 30 sports top top 30 overall Dang. so golf is bigger than fly fishing golf is a little bigger than fly fishing overall yeah the golf book came out the golf book did very well right out of the gate so I think that was the point when the publisher realized we had a series and from that point, I, that was I've done sixteen other fifty places books, so we're up to eighteen. The most recent one that's going to will come out in the spring, and I think it's going to be a successful one. Is uh, fifty places to travel with your dog? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Which is maybe it's the jump the shark moment for the fifty places uh, uh, series, but. You know, the, the ideas, sometimes the ideas will come from me. Sometimes the ideas will come from the the publisher based on what their sales force is hearing from booksellers yeah. and looking at various trends. Exactly. You see the trends. When I see it, when I look at the 50 Places books, I see I've, I'm on your website here at steelhead-communications.com. And, you know, you've got fly fish, you got golf, um, you know, sail, birding diving right i mean hiking it, it's i mean it's outdoor stuff right it's all outdoor focus and for the most part it's stuff that i would like too right except for i'm not good at i've tried surfing I, rock climbing is like is all this stuff for you is all this stuff that you are fully into on, on your own i wish i could say that i was dave but no i i it, it was funny the, the moment of truth for me in writing these books came when they asked me to do sailing which was the third one yeah so that's i had the hard done one. a little bit of, <laughs> i had done a little bit of sailing when i was very young spending the summers up in maine with my grandparents so sailing's a big thing up there and i absolutely hated it and there and i think i hated it because it was the year that when I was 12, 1975, when Jaws came out. Oh, right. So even though I was pretty comfortable on the water, I was just terrified of being out in more open water in a little sailboat. Uh, and I knew that s- sailing had its very much its own nomenclature. And uh, so I was very hesitant about taking that on. But then I, I realized that I don't have to speak technical jargon to sailors i and i i what i need to do is i need to be able to understand how place and travel fits into the sailing experience and understand some of the micro markets um among sailors say for example some sailors are really really into the racing that's what it's about and there are venues that are really all about racing there's some place some sailors who are into you know, Margaritaville style partying, you know, the, the, the boat is a means to an end to connect from one party to another. And, and that's fine. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of uh, more low, low key sailors. And then there are other people that use sailing as a means to really explore out of the way places. Exactly. That's what I would be. I would be, I mean, I, that's what I would hope is I actually have that goal. I have that goal, right. To get out and be a, like, yeah. sailing across the world would be the ultimate i mean to me like seriously out there without just by wind i mean that seems like wow have you talked to a few people that have sailed across the the globe sort of thing i have you know that just because it didn't fit into the format of the book quite as well i didn't talk to any people specifically about that experience but i did talk to a few people who are known for their exploring and who have sailed around the world like i i think in the sailing book i talked to this one gentleman about uh south georgia island which is down you know near antarctica and sailing there in a you know a 40 or 50 foot boat from tierra del fuego and going across the magellan strait where it's you know sometimes the seas can be 40 or 50 feet high and what an adventure that was uh and then who is this guy also happened to be a, a mountain climber so he you know he's he he climbed several large peaks down there that had never been climbed before so he's a real adventurous fellow um but uh you know it was about it was about you know un, understanding the i mean i hate to say it it Kim comes back a little bit to the to the marketing side of things understanding the the appeals of different aspects of the sport um and writing to have that that broad appeal and hopefully expose people who might be inclined towards maybe the 
the racing aspect to think, well, maybe more, more, uh, splunking along and, and, and to, from one little port to another could be interesting too, or, or looking at it in the fly fishing context. I'm sorry. We wandered so far. Yeah, exactly. Field, but, uh, there, you know, the guy, the guy who, who likes steelhead fishing, sleeping in the back of his truck cab, uh, you know, the, the quote unquote, the dirt bag steelhead bum, he probably would hate the experience of going to a lodge in Alaska where everything is done for you. And that person who likes going to the lodge in Alaska might hate the idea. See, I think, I think on that there's some overlap. I mean, for me, because I know personally, it's like, for me, I love the dirt bag in it. You know what I mean? Like waking up. But again, I also, I'm exploring some of the lodge style stuff now. I'm like, well, this lodge is pretty nice too. So I can see, I can see both sides of it. Right. I mean, part of it's like, sure, sure. are expensive. So yeah. But there, there were there were nice aspects of both, or or say the guy, the person that, that, that there's some people I know who only fish tarpon. They they only they don't like the cold and they like the thrill of that of that big fish and and they couldn't care less about fishing for trout. And, and to each his own. They all it all it all works, and there are lots of different ways to come to the sport of fly fishing, and and they're all they're all equally valid. One one man's yeah. One man's treasure is another man's trash, and vice versa. Gotcha, gotcha. So this is cool. So you've got a huge, you know, your body of work, right? I mean, you've got all this time now. We're over twenty years, right? You've been doing this stuff. What I want to hear about the interview process because we're doing right now, right? We're obviously doing an interview, but when you go into your interviews, talk about that. How do you? Let's take the fly fishing book, right? So for somebody sure. who hasn't read it, dug into it. You know, how do you choose, first of all, you know, you've got places and then people and then and then talk about that a little bit on that and then how that interview process works when you get into it. Sure. Um, in the topic of fly fishing, you know, I, I knew who some of the movers and shakers were at, at the time. And uh, I generally would try to there, there were probably a few places that I'd want to have in the book that I would reach out to people like say an example would be Craig Matthews. I, I really wanted to have the Madison in the book. And I knew that not only was, was Craig a great um, knowledge bank and passionate angler on the river, but he'd also done a great deal to conserve access to the river and protect the river. And I always, if I can include a kind of a conservation angle to anything I'm writing, I, I love to try to do that because I think it's important. So maybe I reached out to Craig, uh, explained in an email, you know, what it was I was trying to do and why I wanted to talk to him and would share a draft of what I had written before it went to print because I think anyone who's been quoted has probably been wildly misquoted and since the books live for a while I, I wanted to try to avoid that so that might be how uh, you know I, I approached Craig for some other folks I just said talk to me about anything that you'd like to talk about here's the here's the idea it's not the best it's an experience that's special to you and you know I, I think I take the approach with folks not I don't have a um, a punch list of questions. I just like to ask a leading question at the beginning just to get people going. Some people don't even need a, any kind of a lead in. They you press go and they can go. Uh, and I, I'm probably one of those people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I, uh, I try to get folks going and then I would just follow where they wanted to go and, and then maybe dovetail in a, a few questions to clarify towards the end, but I really wanted to to act as almost a cipher, I, I suppose would be a good term, for the way they related to this place and this fishing experience. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and for those people, without going in deep, is it, um, you know, obviously we're not going to talk about everybody or all the places, but give us a little snippet of what, you know, some of those, a few of those people are that you talk to. Sure. Uh, well, and sadly, a few of these po folks are have passed away now. But I was able to talk to Frank Moore, and of course, Frank spoke about the North Umpqua. I spoke to Ernie Schwebert, who who uh, you know kind oh, of wow. 
first put into print, you know, the idea of matching the hatch and, and wrote a few very, very well-known, well-respected books on that topic. It was kind of a, you know, a, a well-known fishing personality in his day. Oh, yeah. um, I spoke to, um, I spoke to uh, both um, a couple of the, the folks from Orvis um, and I spoke to Perk Perkins and and his dad yep, Perk. Lee Perkins. Yeah. Um, spoke to Leon Gorman, who was the chairman for a long time for LL Bean, and uh, and I spoke to uh, a lot of folks that were more respected in the guide corps, uh, you know, and fly tying corps. Uh, say Paul Weimer was a, was a guy I spoke to who had been on the. Uh, the West Branch of the Delaware. Now I think he's out in Livingston, Montana. I spoke to George uh, George Anderson. Um, I spoke to just. I wanted to speak to a few photographers because you know they have an interesting take. So I, I I spoke to Kathy and Barry Beck, and I spoke to Val Atkinson. So I tried. I really tried to get people who are coming into the sport from a lot of different angles to. Um, to, you know, again, the, your your perspective on the sport is going to differ slightly depending on how you're coming at it. And I wanted to try to represent as, as broad a gallery of, of folks as I could. Right, right, right. What would you, uh, for Ernie uh, Schwiebert, what, uh, what what did you guys talk about there? Well, let's break down that, that process. So talk about that. So you've got Ernie, this bigger than life, right, flight fisherman. How did uh, how did that interview? What do you take us to there? How did that all went? Oh, it was well. Yeah, I I, I remember that very well because he was uh, he was you know a little bit of an older gentleman at the time, and and he spoke very very fast. I remember that being one of the toughest interviews because I had trouble first keeping up with with him in my notes. And then it was also he was he had uh, he was a great storyteller, but there was a lot of tangential information. And he, he spoke about a river that was down in um, in Patagonia. Uh, and it was actually he spoke and it was not one of the super well-known rivers but it was you know most of the lodges down there they service or have access to three or four rivers and this was a river that happened to have landlocked salmon in it and and the story was basically about this huge uh landlocked salmon that no one else had been able to uh catch it was known to live in this pool and how he managed to catch it wow <laughs> and there and there i would say that there were a few folks who definitely spoke of their their heroic quests and and victories. Most most people didn't uh, approach it that way, but this was much more about uh, rest in peace, but a little bit more about Ernie than the place, perhaps. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, Ernie, right, right. But it was a big personality. Yeah, well, I love the and Frank Moore, obviously, RIP Frank, too. You know, I mean, uh, I that was one of the few interviews, you know, we're doing this remotely, but I actually went down and sat down with Frank, you know, in, in their place, like you said. And yeah, it was it was amazing. The whole experience was amazing. And I, I've told this before, but he I asked him what fly I should use, right? Because I've never fished North Umpqua. It was my first time ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, And he said, use a skunk. You know, use a skunk. He said, not a green butt, you know, you know, not that damn green butt. Use a skunk. So I put on a skunk. He basically just showed me. He's like, oh, go down there to this little spot, you know, and went down there, man, and hooked and landed my first uh, North Umpqua steelhead on Frank's fly. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. And I was like, wow. Oh, how tremendous. He had like a, a little, it was kind of a, a very sparse muddler that he liked to fish a lot. And, uh, and, that I know that was also one of his go-to flies, but when when I'd go up and visit, and he'd ask if we'd been fishing or if we were going to go fishing, and and sometimes say, "Yeah, we fish. We're going to head back out." He said, "Well, follow me down," and he'd get in that little brown, I think it was a Volkswagen Rabbit, uh, with a very old car, but he'd go down the hill and we'd follow him, and he'd take us to these his some of his secret spots and say, you know, go to that rock 
walk three yards down from that rock and cast out at 60 degrees and cast out about 50 feet. And, uh, we never, we never hooked up when he was, he was, uh, offering his tutelage, but he was so generous in his, in his information. Uh, and, uh, nice. So, so passionate about, about the river. And I remember he would, uh, is, uh, you probably got to see his, his pet trout that were in the pond behind the house. Oh yeah. And there were, there were a few occasions where he insisted on giving me a roll casting lesson. And he said, you know, I want you to aim for that, that branch across the way. And I said, Frank, I can't, I can't cast it 70 feet with a roll cast. And he said, you know, you do it like this, you do it like this. And I, and while I, while I never quite was able to make the distance, I was with a little help from him. I was able to get a lot closer than I ever thought I, I could roll cast or a lot more distance from a yeah. roll cast than I ever thought I could get. But, but uh yeah wow so he let you you were actually on the river you were actually on his ponds in the back he let you cast which is interesting because when i was there i was like hey well maybe we can go make a few casts he's like oh, pretty much over my dead body you know that's for the kids so it's this pretty funny moment <laughs> oh well we, we I, I can't I, and i can't remember honestly whether we even had a if we had a fly on or just a little piece of uh it was just a full piece of yarn, but uh, but he did. We did go back there and practice casting, and he was he had his regular enthusiasm. Today's episode is sponsored by Country Financial. The fires in the Northwest and throughout the West, and in, in the last few years, have been devastating for thousands of people. Uh, those folks, some folks, have lost their homes, their belongings, uh, and their sense of safety has all been challenged. This is why insurance and protecting your assets are so critical. Dalton at Country Financial is here, and he was on the front lines during the fires, handing out checks to Country Financial community members, providing drinks, food, and more. And each time Dalton meets up with a client, he does an extensive review of their current assets and coverage. This is his opportunity to really decide and let you know what you need uh, to make educated decisions for your insurance needs. This is a super critical piece. And Dalton Roy, Roy loves it. He loves getting out in the rural community, connecting with people, loves the outdoors, fishing, hunting, everything that goes with it. And so I'm excited to be sharing uh, Country Financial and Dalton with you. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash country right now to get started. That's C-O-U-N-T-R-Y. Check out Dalton and support this podcast in a great local company right now. Well, let's, uh, you know, the 50 Plays, obviously there's a whole bunch of, uh, you've got a lot of content and books there. Um, you know, just wrapping that up again, what else would you, you know, if somebody was interested in digging in anything, you know, I mean, it sounds like you got more coming. I mean, is that the plan here? You've got more 50 places books and there's like an, an unlimited uh, topics, right? You can keep going. I feel like, I feel like we're getting to the end of the road here. Oh, really? Dave, I, I thought that, I thought that, uh, Three books ago would be the last one, but it, it. Yeah, I do notice the fifty more places to play golf. So, is there going to be a fifty more places to fly fish before you die? There is actually. There you go. And I mean, the funny, a little funny story about that is, I think the the problem. I mean, I felt like you know when I did that book, it was six or seven years later. I knew a heck of a lot more of about the destinations because I'd been to a lot of more foreign destinations than I had been when I did the first book. And so I just understood the sport overall better. And so I really feel like in a lot of respects, it's a better book. But I think what happened is booksellers didn't realize 100% that it was a different book. And when it was put out there, if it was put out on the on the shelves, customers were more inclined to, to buy the first one and they didn't really understand that the second one was a follow-up so it was it was a little bit of a positioning branding question but it, yeah neither neither one of the more places did very well commercially weirdly enough though i felt like i was in a much better yeah. position to write them at the time than i did when i did the yeah, first yeah. ones but uh so that was a little bit of a, of a learning uh, process but 
you know, we, what we've kicked around, uh, you know, I did one unifier for, for a lot of the activities I wrote about was, was having a, a nice glass of beer afterwards. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I did 50 places to drink beer and that one has done, done fairly well. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a, uh, maybe 50 places to, to drink wine. Oh, wow. So yeah. So you actually, there's a, is there a beer? There is a beer, yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> there is, and, and uh, several, and several Oregon. I always, uh, I always try to get a few Oregon venues into each of the books, and and we in in the Beaver State here, we we have f- fine representations in most outdoor sports categories, and certainly in beer categories. So, uh, so it's not too much of a stretch to do that. Right on. No, this is cool. And you got some other stuff, you know, we're not going to be able to get like always touch on everything, but um, talk about the last steelhead. You've got some, some stuff going on here. I always love a little music and, uh, and sometimes I'll ask people, you know, kind of a favorite group or whatever, but talk about, you have a little music background too, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's amazing as I think about it, it's been 13 years. Uh, I have been part of a band here in Portland called Catch and Release. And I named it, by the way, <laughs> thinking that because we had to figure everyone needs a little bit of a uh, of a shtick. Yep. And uh, so we jokingly refer to ourselves as Portland's premier fly fishing inspired band. Uh, that and four dollars will buy a cup of coffee. But uh, we uh, we've we've done a lot of recording over the years. I think we've recorded four or five CDs and, and we play out with, with regularity and we do a lot more than just fishing songs. But, but, um, back in, uh, 2018, I had done an article for, um, American angler. I think it's now defunct. Unfortunately, it was a nice magazine, but, uh, I had done a, a in-depth story about the decline of B run steelhead, uh, those fish that are they're heading mostly to Idaho waters, and you know what was behind it, and and uh, some of the management decisions that may have negatively impacted the fish, but other other uh, facets of uh, that have been impacting the productivity of the runs. And as I was researching that story, I thought, wow, this is this has kind of a lot of dramas of almost epic kind of proportions that could lend itself to, um, you know, a more th- thoughtful, dramatic presentation. And I thought that, you know, you start when you talk to people on the street who aren't anglers, they barely know the difference between a salmon and a steelhead, let alone the difference between a native fish or a wild fish. And, and it's just very confusing. So I thought maybe music would be a way to reach a few more people with some of the, the issues facing the fish. And, um, so I, I wrote this series of songs and my, my bandmates were kind enough to be willing to uh, go into the studio with me and a few conservation groups, um, including uh, the Conservation Angler, which is based here in Portland, Trout Unlimited, and I believe it's the Wild Steelhead Coalition. They all kicked in some money to help underwrite the recording and the production of the CD. So, so we did that. And uh, yeah, and you can access that out on the uh, Steelhead Communications website. You can stream it. Oh, and you can. Uh, the lyrics are there. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the bad news is that uh, that you have to hear me sing on some, but there are some other singers too who sing better than I. And, and uh, I, I think it does a, an okay job of at least representing some of the some of the challenges the fish face, and hopefully even explaining some of the issues a little bit. Yeah. And what uh, what do you play? What what's your instrument? I play uh, I play guitar and uh, sing, uh, sort of. Um, and um, we're basic. We're we're we play we play in different different formats. We'll we'll play as kind of a straight ahead rock band. You know to two electric guitars, bass and drums. 
Um, but we'll also play acoustic and the, the other guitar player, Sloan Morris is a, he's a brilliant mandolin player and mm, harmonica nice. player. And the, the drummer, Doug Mateer is an excellent guitar player and plays steel drums, uh, a lot of different, different instruments. So when we play acoustically or when we go into the uh, studio, we can, do a lot of a lot of different things and, and get a lot of different sounds so it's a lot of fun i feel very lucky to have you know hooked up with a couple of music majors and we're all excuse me old enough now that we we all have realistic uh ideas about where this is going to go which is probably not anywhere too far but we have fun with it and, and it's fun to play out play live now and again and fun to record that's right. Where, where do you guys play live? Can you see, is there anything upcoming in 23 that people can, or any regular venues you're at? Oh, you know, well, we, we play in, in, in Portland, we play pretty regularly at the, at the Oakshire beer hall, which is uh, Oakshire is a fairly big craft brewer in Eugene, but they have a, a nice beer hall in Northeast Portland. And we play there pretty regularly and we play a few other pubs around town and we've gotten to, to go out of state a few times and play at events. We, we had a great time a few years ago. We played over at the trout hunter on the Henry's fork and uh, oh, nice. we were able to play on in the backyard there. They had a big barbecue and one of the local bands played and then we played and uh we got to play the grateful dead song fire on the mountain as the sun was setting behind the centennial mountains and the oh cool May flies are fluttering around on the henry's fork it was a pretty special wow. occasion wow wow that's me yeah this is cool i could see i mean this would be really cool i can imagine if somebody was there that would be pretty great and, and for us we're doing some starting to get some events going you know, it'd be great to, you know, even if it worked out to have you guys out at something that we, we did down the line as well. We are always happy to play. And we've, we, we, we try, if people ask us to, to play benefits, we're always happy to help. We've done an event for uh, Bucky Buckstabber's uh, Fly Fishing Collaborative oh, yeah. for a few years yep. running when it was at the Mac Club. I think we're doing it this year. It'll be at a different venue, but we're always happy to try to try to support local, local conservation groups. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, fundraisers over the years for Leukemia Lymphoma Society is one of our, one of our friends is very involved there tam driscoll so um yeah we're we just lo we love to play and it's not about it's not about the money if they if people give us a few beers we're happy that's right that's right perfect well well you mentioned the grateful dead do you have a i'm always this is a good i always like to get this because it gives us a chance to send in a, we'll put your stuff in the in the show notes as well some links to your music but as far as a group or band that you really love that was a big influence on you over the years unquestionably uh <laughs> i i think i i saw my first grateful dead concert in 1983 so they oh, wow. they, they were yeah. certainly on the on the wane but uh yeah i i i have been a, a big fan for a, for a long time and uh my satellite radio station very seldom strays from number 23 which is the serious grateful dead station <laughs> so, oh yeah you got those yeah do you consider yourself like a, were you a deadhead at any point in your life oh i well ne never to the point that i was you know traveling from city to city to city selling macrame yeah. owls to support my right. uh, habit <laughs> but when i was on the you know lived on the east coast they would do an east coast tour in the fall and the spring and once I had gone to the first concert, I would I would go to a few concerts each time that they came through because it was with usually there were a couple that were within three or four hours drive of where I was in Vermont. And uh, I, you know, never, never totally left the straight world, but I, I would dally in the Grateful Dead world a little bit. Yeah. When I moved to right. San Francisco, it was uh, a little easier because. Oh right! They were they were oh, often yeah. playing there. there. <laughs> I had Jerry Garcia's daughter in my house once. That no was, kidding. Yeah. So you moved to San Francisco without um, really. You weren't a great Grateful Dead fan at that time, or no, you were. Yeah, you. Definitely oh no, I, I already was. I I had been probably yeah. for for almost ten years at that point. But that wasn't that wasn't the the motivating factor. But it was a nice uh, fringe benefit. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh you mentioned one, but give us a Grateful Dead song we can put in the show notes that we can listen to to take us as we start to think about taking us out of here. Jack Straw. 
And I know they didn't really have, you know, the great thing about the Grateful Dead is, Chris, I was going to say, sorry, one more thing, is that I heard this fun fact is that the Grateful Dead only had one number one album or song or something like that in the history, but they were so huge, right? One top 10 song. It, it was a Touch of Grey, 1987. Yep. There you go. I could, I, go. I could probably start throwing out lots of uh, Grateful Dead Arcana. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, if you had a, I think my, I think my, my favorite, favorite Grateful Dead song would be uh, the Jack Straw, which was actually a, a Bob Weir composition, but, uh, but one they played really throughout their, their whole career or from 71 on. Yeah, Jack Straw. Is that the one? I'm always thinking like Tennessee Jed too. That's, I always get them mixed up and mumbled together oh yeah no, they're 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 all from all written in that same period they had a very period, uh, yeah. prolific Better run there and yeah. from 69 to 73 or so a lot of great songs exactly what i loved about the dead was they i mean i'm a big old country influence probably more than the dead i love the dead too but you know mm -hmm. i mean they sang some songs like there were some real haggard songs and some stuff they did so they were a lot of like country right a big country influence it seems like to me oh absolutely and i, and I love their i love their their country country's takes and they did you know they weren't on any of the albums but they they did golden thread and silver needles and they they did a dolly parton song um uh, they did a, quite a few country numbers uh, mm -hmm. and they did a, they still play mama tried the merle haggard song oh yeah, and I, I really liked that um uh, that part of their sound uh they yeah. drew from i always thought you know and i think about me and I, I i do love music uh i think that you know in some ways they were one of the most american of of bands because they really drew from jazz they drew from blues and their earlier material they certainly were in had the psychedelic element they had the bluegrass element they really brought right. it all together and, and made their own kind of unique sound from it yeah what about from now you know the grateful obviously Jerry goes away, you know, is gone. Another RIP, right? Or that's the kind of here a theme today, but right. You know, what about Fish? Are there other bands out there? I know there's never be another Grateful Dead, but anybody else that you kind of follow that is similar on that those lines? You know, I, I there are so many great bands out there, but I I I feel like it's, it's the same thing with all the great television that is out there now. It's so overwhelming. I think people can either devote themselves to, to trying everything that's new or the conservative position is to go back to what you know. And I, I tend to fall into that camp. Uh, some of my, one of my bandmates is really in, into, he's very much a deadhead first and foremost, but he's very into fish as well. But yeah, I haven't, he's and he's encouraged me to go to a concert with him and just go with an open mind. Cause he says, it's not, you know, it, 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 they do a lot of improvisation, a lot of jamming, mm -hmm. quote unquote. But, but it's not to think of it like a Grateful Dead thing because it's a it's a different thing. So I haven't really yeah. jumped on on that bandwagon. But I would say that you know the acts that, that I enjoy would definitely fall into the singer singer songwriter category. I, I mean, I think Richard Thompson is a brilliant talent that just doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, nice. I really, I really like the work of John Hyatt as well, who's a little more has a little more of a, of a of a pop sensibility perhaps, but still writes writes some great great songs. Um, nice. But I'll I'll put on Iggy Pop and the Stooges sometimes too, and go in the other direction. So I I'm uh, uh, I have yep. pretty Catholic tastes, I guess. Perfect. No, this is great. I, I love. Uh... I love getting a little background here because music is always kind of a, you know, a big thing for me too. And same thing with fish. Like I've, I've, I like, you know, fish listen, but it's never, you know, I always go back to just the dead. I'd rather listen to some old, whatever dead albums. And you know what I mean? Like, and it sounds like the serious, we, uh, it sounds like that's a valid you, getting that you're going to hear a bunch of random, awesome old live dead stuff on Sirius. They do. They play, they play a, a pretty good uh, assortment of music from, from the whole, you know, dead uh, families, musical contributions over the years. And I have to say that one thing I th think amongst the deadheads that was a pleasant surprise uh, was the Dead and Company, which is sort of the latest iteration. I think a lot of deadheads were horrified at the notion of John Mayer 
being the the lead guitarist just because of perhaps his reputation as the kind of ladies man and uh oh, just yeah. seeming a little bit not quite uh substantial enough maybe to fill fill those shoes of jerry but most i think he's a brilliant guitarist and he's 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 true to the spirit of the songs but brings his own skill which is which is considerable uh to the music and uh it's been i feel like it's given bob weir and, and the drummers new energy and they have a they have wonderful keyboard player and a wonderful bass player and uh they're they're fun to listen to uh and oh, i wow. never i never really went to many of the spin-off grateful dead bands but i i've enjoyed listening to them so it does show how the, the music has uh has long legs to keep running this is perfect so and i didn't even realize so you know i'm out of loop on this so what is the name of the this the newer kind of whatever not grateful dead but the kind of um what's the name of the group or they've the been ones? touring as dead and dead and company they're going to do their last tour next summer and then they're going to be done because i think bob weir must be 75 76 oh wow so i'm sure he's yeah and know. he's the yeah he's the last remaining the, the name yeah. you love yeah Nice, Chris. Well, this is uh, this is pretty cool. I'm I definitely always, like I said, glad we take a music, and it's awesome to hear you got your band. Do you spend, you know, when you think of your time is, you know, throughout the week, you know, the day, whatever, you know, it, music's on the side gig, right? You're you're doing the writing. Is that still? But it sounds like, I mean, if is is it something that you could go in? Yeah, mu- music music is definitely uh, m- music. I would definitely say is the is an avocation where where the the writing is a is a vocation, but, but, you know, I, we, I write a lot of songs and, and can kind of, you know, sometimes my various activities, whether it's music or, or writing, or, you know, I do some fiction writing as well. They all kind of complement each other a little bit. So it's all, all melds sort of together. Um, but the, the music, you know, we, if we, we try to rehearse once a week, we don't always hit that, but we, you know, if we have a bigger gig or if we're going recording, uh, we try to get the material down and we'll practice a little more intensely, but it's definitely, uh, it's on the side, but a serious side. It's on the side. Okay. And just on the steelhead communications, uh, the website steelhead dash communication, that's kind of your main hub for kind of all the the marketing work and stuff you do uh, on top of everything we've talked about today. It is uh, honestly that, that, that site is probably a little more geared toward the, um, the advertising and marketing work uh, that I've done. And at this point in time, I don't really go out looking for those sort of projects anymore. If people call me or if it's someone I've worked with before, I'm happy to work on it. But most of my, it's, it's an interesting when I wrote the first book, you know, in 2003, 20% of my time was given over to editorial writing and, and 80% was more marketing and copywriting advertising work. Now it's completely flipped to maybe it's maybe yeah. more 85% writing and 15% consulting stuff. But that's amazing. I still do it from time to time. And, yeah. uh, I probably would, be, I probably would, um, sell a few more books if i were more active on social media but i i'm i'm on the wrong end edge of that generational divide i'm afraid and it i i sometimes i don't find my life that interesting so i can't imagine that anyone else would find it interesting so i've just never really engaged there so much and but it's it's fun to to reach out a little bit through through your auspices exactly that's what i was saying i mean it is interesting that's the cool thing but um i love that it sounds like we've taken a you know a tour down your life and now you know these books these 50 places which is where we kind of started i mean is what you know you spend most of your time working on right i mean that's that's pretty amazing to think right that that's the what you've created this this thing that's probably going to keep going it sounds like for at least a few more years well, it's, it, it's amazing that, you know, that first book came out in 2004 and it still sells 3000 copies a year. Wow. And that's where, that's where, where the lady, the lady who, 
who is known as a fly fisher off in her office. That's why she gets a copy every two years and now owns seven of them. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it just, it has that, that gift book attraction. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's been book. a, I thought it was a curse at first, but it's been more of a blessing. Yeah. No, I've been lucky. It's good. Right on, Chris. Well, I will let you get out of here. Um, we will send everybody out. Uh, well, I guess we got the website we mentioned a couple of times at Steelhead Communications, and uh, we'll leave some links to your uh, everything else you have going. And um, yeah, thanks for all the time today and shedding some light on these books. We'll definitely get some people out there and check these things out. Well, it's a, it's been uh, really fun talking to you, Dave. Uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, hope we have the chance to chat again or or uh, play a little music for you if you if you do an event at some point. So there you go wetflyswing.com slash 392 okay so we wrapped up that steelhead school that was a pretty epic trip we're going to be talking a little more about that as we go but uh it really doesn't get any better than that we're going to be excited in 2023 to do that trip again uh and we are going to do a few more so if you're if you want to get in on that that one all i can say is we had so many chrome bright fish um just cool rivers cool people uh jeff liske and the crew and his uh his guides the crew out there was second to none and and i know everybody that was involved in it was just blown away so hope uh hope you can get involved in some of these trips that are moving forward we're going to be putting together some of the best guides uh, around the country and uh, and we're excited to be doing this as part of uh supporting uh the community supporting you and giving a shot to get on the water I hope you are having a good evening, a good morning, or a good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate your support, and I will talk to you very soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.